My name is David Sam, and um, I'm part of the project which Rival has been talking about. And um, I'll just give you some research findings based on part of the projects and looking particularly at one of the hypotheses which, uh, which John Berry talked about earlier this afternoon. So I'm going to be looking into the whole idea of the multiculturalism hypothesis as it exists in Norway, looking at Russian speaking speakers in Norway and also Norwegian nationals, ethnic Norwegians. And one of the things which we all very aware is that there is hardly any society, contemporary society, which is not multicultural. In effect, most contemporary societies are made up of various ethnic groups trying to live side and side. And one of the challenges they face is to how they can live together harmoniously and also to feel that they all belong to the same larger society. This is what a lot of societies, contemporary societies, are trying to do. And so multiculturalism as a concept, of course, has several meanings. One of the meanings is the existence of various ethnic groups living together. And the other aspect is using the kind of policies that can be used in order to get people to feel that they belong to one society. And one aspect of it, of course, relates the kind of policies that different countries run. Of course, we can also talk about multiculturalism as some form of governance, because you can have a policy, but then the policies may not work out. So we can talk about multiculturalism as some form of governance as well. But we'll be looking more into multiculturalism as a policy. And multiculturalism as a policy has two main components. And one component, of course, is that cultural diversity is good for the individual and also for the society as a whole. The other aspect of multiculturalism is that to get some form of interaction, intercultural contacts among the members in order to promote some form of inclusiveness. So we, it's good for the society, it's good for the individuals, but then we also, it's important that the individuals are able to feel that they belong to the society and they are able to interact with each other. Canada, of course, is said to be the first country to have implemented multiculturalism as a policy. I wouldn't say it's the first country to become multicultural, but then it's the country that officially went out to carry out multiculturalism as a policy. And the idea behind the Canadian multiculturalism, of course, was to promote good relationships among the members and also to create some form of mutual acceptance among members. One of the points which was also made earlier today that the Canadian ambassador was talking about after one generation. And actually, Canada currently has gone through several phases of their multiculturalism. It's, it has gone through several stages. I'm not going to go through these stages. But at least they, they argue that there is the need for mutual acceptance among the people living in that society. Yes, um, and then, of course, one of the things which uh, Professor Berry talked about earlier today talks about the different components that go into the Canadian multiculturalism. He talks about an aspect of the uh -huh. cultural component, that it's one area where effort needs to be made, effort needs to be targeted in creating a, a harmonious or a well-functioning multicultural society. There is also the aspect of the intercultural component, and of course there is the communication component. But in this presentation, I'm actually going to focus more on the cultural component. And if you remember this uh, figure which John Berry used, we are basically talking about the multiculturalism hypothesis. And <clears throat> taking a very close look at this figure, which of course you've seen earlier on, it's all aiming at a policy goal to create a policy of mutual acceptance among all ethnocultural groups. But then to attain that, you also <coughs> need to work on the cultural component. Of, and then there are the hypothesis, sorry, 
the link between the cultural component and the social component, which links to the integration hypothesis. And the third one relates to the link between the social component and then the policy goal, which relates to the contact hypothesis. But as I said, I've analyzed or we've analyzed data on all these three hypotheses. And they have worked in various ways. But the multiculturalism hypothesis, I would say, kind of worked pretty well in Norway. And I'll share some of the findings with you. But before then, the cultural component, again, is intended to promote security and confidence of all ethnocultural groups. And it's believed that by providing support and also encouragement for cultural maintenance and development among all ethnocultural groups. So there is the desire, the goal to support the various cultural groups within the society. It's very important. And it's also designed to ensure the continuity of the society of a generation. And this, of course, leads to the multiculturalism hypothesis. If the groups are not harmonious, if the groups are not able to support one another, basically what is going to happen is that the various ethnocultural groups either will go into position with each other or they will go into extinction, at least from my point of view. And this is what the hypothesis in the broader sense says that when individuals feel secure in their groups and um, in their groups and personal place in society, with respect to their cultural identity and their economic situation, they will be more acceptant of those who differ from themselves. Said in another way, if I'm not secure in myself, I'm very likely to feel threatened when another group tries to get very close to me. I may feel that my chances of surviving in the, in the labor market is threatened because another ethnic, another cultural group is going to take that away from me. But then when I feel secure that this is not a zero-sum game, we are all here for the welfare, for the well-being of the society. We support one another. Then I'll be more open and be tolerant towards other people. But then when I feel threatened, then I kind of literally tell my back on the people that, look, if you don't like me, I don't like you. It's as simple as that. And of course, uh, if people feel culturally, economically, and personally threatened, they reject others who are different from themselves. So you either open up or you shut yourself up to other people. And of course, um, <clears throat> there are different ways in which you can kind of operationalize and see whether the multiculturalism hypothesis is working. But one study reported in Barry and Colin Ward suggested that for the dominant group, those who feel that they are accepted also tended to have, I mean, when I say feel I tend to more acceptance of multicultural ideology. And the multicultural ideology is the idea that it's good for people of different ethnic groups to live side and side, is good to support one another and so on. That is the multicultural ideology. So it's another level of multiculturalism as a concept. The policy, the ideology, the demographic fact and so on. And when people, majority people, scoring high on multicultural ideology, it also increases their level of self-esteem and also higher life satisfaction. So th this is more or less the background to it. And so what I tried to do was, OK. And of course, that is what was also done in much of the book, which John currently I just sent it to the publishers some few days ago, is does multiculturalism hypothesis work in Norway, looking into Russian speakers and Norwegians? And uh, the project, of course, is funded by the Research Council of Norway. And the whole idea is to try to do some form of a comparative study. Ideally, of course, it's possible to do that. Ideally, a good comparative study should involve three different countries. So it's good to have a third country, let's say Finland, with Russians. 
these three countries all have different history, but unfortunately the funding was just for these two countries. But the good thing is that we have colleagues, we have collaborators, so it's possible even to see the larger picture. But currently we are looking at the situation in Norway. 500 ethnic Norwegians, 250 Russian-speaking immigrants in Norway. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how the data was collected. The, believe me when I say so. Uh, we have good data sets. The questionnaire, we spent very long time to develop the questionnaires. We used online data collection. Thanks be to my colleagues here in Estonia. Everything is so expensive in Norway, so they saw to it. And we have very good data sets. And without really going into if we're interested, we can share some of the specific questions as they were asked. But then what we tried to do was to make some form of a prediction. And the whole idea was to predict various forms of ethnocentrism. Basically, you look down on other people, you have some form of a prejudice towards other people. And the whole idea is we are going to make to predict in-group feeling, how warm you feel about your own group, how you feel about others, and the kind of trust you have with the out-group, and so on. And then, of course, the multicultural ideology itself. And then we also looked at self-esteem and life satisfaction. So these were the outcome variables that we're interested in. And the predictors were issues related to ethnic identity, national identity, intergroup uh, anxiety, and security. These are predictors, and of course, before you really can tell how well these are working, you need to look into the demographic issues, age and gender, which we did. And uh, what we found was that generally the demographic factors just made just 5% contribution, that is age and gender. Issues relating to how long the person had lived in Norway, issues relating to, I don't remember, but they were not so significant. It's mostly gender and age, age were the demographic factors that we use. And generally, their contribution was very limited. And quite often, when we added our main predictors, the explain variance, that is the extent to which you can explain the outcome, went up by a between 8 and 20% extra. So from 5, it could shoot up to 18, or it could shoot up to 20. So the four predictors that we used, ethnic identity, national identity, intergroup, anxiety, and so on, they actually made significant contribution. And I won't, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but this is kind of how the analysis looked like. We have the predictors there, we have the outcomes here, and run separate analysis. But I know these numbers are too small for you to see. So I've tried to summarize them in just very simple text. That when we move into the second step, after the demographic and move on to the second step, the models became significant. The demographic factors made significant contribution, but quite, extent, quite often the whole model was not significant. But whenever we added our main predictors, they became significant. And the different predictors work differently, but there seemed to be some form of a consistent pattern. So mm -hmm. when we take um, the results regarding the Russians, or the Russian speakers in Norway, what we realize is that security, feeling that feeling secured in your own identity was possibly related to in-group feelings. You feel good about your own group. You feel good about the out-group. You also have a good trust. You trust the out-group that they are not here to cheat you. And then they also had high multi multicultural ideology that it's good to have a multicultural society. And they felt good about their self. Um, they were happy. Life satisfaction was also positive. And furthermore, <clears throat> or to put it another way, 
more individuals that, that is, they felt secure, the more individuals felt secured, the more positive were their feelings towards their own group and towards our group. And similarly, the more trust they had in the out group and the more acceptance towards multiculturalism. And of course, I've already talked about this earlier on. Furthermore, when we think about the Russian results, what we see is that ethnic identity and national identity, and when I talk about national identity, I'm talking about the way Russians also think about adopting Norwegian identity. It's not just Norwegian identity, but how do Russians feel about also taking on Norwegian identity. And it had high in-group feelings. <coughs> Either ethnic identity or national identity, they felt good about themselves. They also had higher score multicultural ideology and also had better life satisfaction. Ethnic identity was related to high in-group bias which in a way is not too surprising. When you have very high ethnic group identity, you may feel biased towards your own group. And national identity was related to low in-group bias, which again, I don't think is too surprising. This is the Norwegian side. Again, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but then I'll give you a quick summary of what the findings were. And again, what we see here is that high feelings of security were related to high in-group feeling. They were also related to high out-group feeling, very similar to what the Russians, the Russian speakers were reporting in Norway. And then also high multicultural ideology scores and better life satisfaction. You remember, you see, you remember that this was what we were talking about earlier on. And security again was related to low in-group feelings High ethnic identity scores were related to high in-group feelings and high in-group bias. Which again, yeah, I'm not very, you shouldn't be surprised with this kind of findings. So generally, the results seem to support the multiculturalism hypothesis. I really don't think I need to go through these results. You can read them yourselves. Generally, the multiculturalism hypothesis was supported in Norway. Now, one of the reasons why I decided to focus on the multiculturalism hypothesis is that there haven't been a lot of studies on the multiculturalism hypothesis, but there are tons of studies on the contact hypothesis and tons of studies on the integration hypothesis. And meta-analytic studies have found support to that. And so this is an area which I think needs to, we need to do more research to find out whether they really work. And <clears throat> I think they do. So multiculturalism hypothesis to a large extent, based on our data, is supported in Norway for Russian speakers and also for Norwegians. Back to this model. This is how it looks like. Now, just remember that I have focused on on the one side of the equation. So it, it doesn't really mean that by getting multiculturalism working, or I mean multiculturalism hypothesis working, everything will fall in place. There are these two other blocks to contend with. And this is one of the messages I would like to leave with you, that um, Angela Merkel, among others, the former British Prime Minister, David Cameron, has said the same thing. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy has said that multiculturalism has failed. And I think if we focus on a little piece of the big equation, we probably will come out and say that multiculturalism has failed. But I believe that the aspect relating to multiculturalism hypothesis works pretty well in Norway. How it works in Estonia, you will get back to that. Not today, but then we are working on it. And what can be done? It's something that uh, needs to be discussed because I believe that if we're able to do a proper multiculturalism hypothesis and also to put in place the inter uh, integration hypothesis and also to work on the contact hypothesis, we'll be in a better position to draw any clear conclusion. So the issue is that 
what can we do to promote the culture component? And hopefully, by so doing, we'll be able to create a better Estonian society where the various ethnic minority groups and the majority group, I mean the Estonians, can live harmoniously. Thank you.